Oh, hello. So I'll be reading the book Pattern Theory by David Mumford and Agnes Desonneux. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Um, here's the cover of my copy. On the inner pages are these ones. And I'll, I'll be, be reading, reading a version of chapter zero. So we're going to be covering this chapter today. Uh, please excuse my English, uh, it's not perfect. I'm not a native speaker, but I did spend a lot of time in the US during my life. Hope you enjoy it. Chapter zero. What is pattern theory? The term pattern theory was coined by Ulf Grenander to distinguish his approach to the analysis of pattern structures in the world from pattern recognition. In this book, we use it in a rather broad sense to include the statistical methods used in analyzing all signals generated by the world, whether they be images, sound, written text, DNA, or protein strings, spike strains in neurons, or time series of prices or weather. Examples from all of these appear either in Grenander's book, Elements of Pattern Theory, or in the work of our colleagues, collaborators, and students on pattern theory. We believe the work in all these areas has a natural unity, common techniques and motivations. In particular, pattern theory proposes that the types of patterns and the hidden variables needed to describe these patterns that are found in one class of signals will be often will often be found in the others and that their characteristic variability will be similar. Hence, the stochastic models used to describe signals in one field will crop up in many other signals. The underlying idea is to find classes of stochastic models that can capture all the patterns that we see in nature, so that random samples from these models have the same look and feel as the samples from the world itself. Then the detection of patterns in noisy and ambiguous samples can be achieved by the use of Bayes' rule, a method that can be described as analysis by synthesis. Section 0.1, the manifesto of pattern theory. We can express this approach to signals and their patterns in a set of five basic principles, the first three of which are as follows. One, a variety of signals result from observing the world, all of which show patterns of many kinds. These patterns are caused by objects, processes, and laws present in the world, but at least partially hidden from direct observation. The patterns can be used to infer information from these unobserved factors. Observations are affected by many variables that are not conveniently modeled deterministically because they are too complex or too difficult to observe and often belong to other categories of events, which are irrelevant to the observation of interest. To make inferences in real time or with a model of reasonable size, we must model our observations partially stochastically and partially deterministically. Accurate stochastic models are needed to capture the patterns present in the signal while respecting their natural structures, that is, symmetries, independences of parts, Marginals on key statistics. These models should be learned from the data and validated by sampling. Inferences from them can be made by using Bayes' rule, provided that the model samples resemble real signals. As an example, a microphone or an ear respond to a pressure wave, P of T, transmitted by the air from a speaker's mouth. Figure 1 shows a function, P of T, with many obvious patterns. It divides into four distinct segments, each of which has a very different character. These are four phones caused by changes in the configuration of the mouth and vocal cords of the speaker during the passage of air, which in turn are caused by the intention of the speaker's brain to utter a certain word. These patterns in P encode in a noisy, highly variable way the sequence of phones being pronounced and the word these phones make up. We cannot observe the phones or the words directly, hence they are called the hidden variables, but we must infer them. Early work on speech recognition attempted to make this inference deterministically by using logical rules based on binary features extracted from P of T. For instance, 
Table 1 shows some of the features used to distinguish English consonants. Table 1, features of English consonants. Continued voice, nasal, labial, coronal, anterior, strident. This deterministic rule-based approach failed, and the state of the art is to use a family of precisely tuned stochastic models, hidden Markov models, and a Bayesian maximum a posteriori or map estimator as an improvement. The identical story played out in vision, in pars parsing sentences from text, in expert systems, and so forth. In all cases, the initial hope was that the deterministic laws of physics plus logical syllogisms for combining facts would give reliable methods for decoding the signals of the world in all modalities. These simple approaches seem to always fail because the signals are too variable and the hidden variables too subtly encoded. One reason for this is that there are always so many extraneous factors affecting the signal. Noise in a microphone, in the ear, other sounds in the room besides the speaker, variation in the geometry of the speaker's mouth, the speaker's mood, and so on. Although in principle one might hope to know these as well as the word being pronounced, inferring each extra factor takes, makes the task more difficult. In some cases, such as radioactive decaying PET scans, it is even impossible by quantum theory. Thus, Stochastic models are required. Now, the world is very complex, and the signals it generates are likewise complex, both in their patterns and in their variability. If pattern theory makes any sense, some rules must exist whereby the patterns caused by the objects, processes, and laws in the world are not like some arbitrary, recursively numerable set. For instance, in the movie Contact, the main character discovers life in outer space because it broadcasts signals encoding the primes from 2 to 101. If infants had to recognize this sort of pattern in order to learn to speak, they would never succeed. By and large, the patterns in the signals received by our senses are correctly learned by infants, at least to the level required to reconstruct the various types of objects in the world and their properties and to communicate with adults. This is a marvelous fact, and pattern theory attempts to understand why this is so. Two further key ideas can be added to the manifesto to explain this. Four, the various objects, processes, and rules of the world produce patterns that can be described as precise, pure patterns, distorted, and transformed by a limited family of deformations, similar across all modalities. When all the stochastic factors affecting any given observation are suitably identified, they show a large amount of conditional independence. The last point is absolutely essential to creating reasonably simple stochastic models. For example, suppose Alice and Bob are two suspects being interrogated in two separate rooms. Then, given what they, know, what they both know and have planned and what they have communicated to each other, Directly or indirectly, their actions are independent. See many further details in Pearl's very important book. To apply pattern theory properly, it is essential to identify correctly the patterns present in a signal. We often have an intuitive idea of the important patterns, but the human brain does many things unconsciously and also takes many shortcuts to get things done quickly. Thus, a careful analysis of the actual data to see what they are telling us is preferable to slapping together an off-the-shelf Gaussian or log linear model based on our guesses. Here is a very stringent test of whether a stochastic model is a good description of the world. Sample from it. This is so obvious that one would assume everyone does this, but in actuality this is not so. The samples from many models that are used in practice are absurd oversimplification over of real signals. And even worse, some theory do not include the signal itself as, it, as one of its random variables, using only some derived variables. So it is not even possible to sample from, 
signals from them. Remark one, this was, for instance, the way most traditional speech recognition systems worked. Their approach was to throw away the raw speech signal in the pre-processing stage and replace it with codes designed to ignore speaker variation. In contrast, when all humans listen to speech, they're clearly aware of the idiosyncrasies of the individual speaker's voice and of any departures from the normal. The idea of starting by extracting some hopefully informative features from a signal and only there classifying it via some statistical algorithm is enshrined in classic texts such as 64. In what ways is pattern theory different from better known fields of statistical pattern recognition? Traditionally, the focus of statistical pattern recognition was the study of one, of one or more data sets x sub alphas in R k for all alpha in i with the goals of a fitting parametric and non-parametric probability distributions to each data set b finding optimal decision rules for classifying new data into the correct data set and c separating a single data set into clusters when it appears to be a mixture the essential issue is, is the bias variance trade-off. To model fully the complexity of the data source, but not the accidental variations of the specific data set. When Grinder first proposed pattern theory as, its, as a distinct enterprise, his approach has several very novel aspects. He put forth the following five propositions. One, to describe the patterns in, a typical, in typical data sets, we should always look for appropriate hidden variables in terms of which the patterns are more clearly described. Two, the set of variables observed and hidden typically forms the vertices of a graph as in Gribbs models, and one must formulate prior probability distributions for the hidden variables as well as models for the observed variables. This graph itself might be random and its variability must then be modeled. One can list the different types of deformations of patterns are subject to, thus creating the basic classes of stochastic models that can be applied. These five, these models should be used for pattern synthesis as well as analysis. As the subject evolved, statistical pattern recognition merged with the area of neural nets, and the first two ideas were absorbed into the statistical pattern recognition. These so-called graphical models are now seen as the bread and butter of the field and discovering these hidden variables is a challenging new problem. The use of prior models has become the mainstream approach in vision and expert systems as it has been in speech since 1960s. The other aspects of pattern theory, however, are still quite distinctive. The basic types of patterns. Let us be more precise about the kinds of patterns and deformations referred to in point 4 above. Real-world signals show two very distinct types of patterns. We can call these 1. Value patterns and 2. Geometrical patterns. Signals in general are some sort of function f from x to v. The domain may be continuous, such as a part of a space, such as the retina or an interval of time, or discrete, such as the nodes of a graph or a discrete sample in space or time. And the range may be a vector space or a binary, or something in the middle. In the case of value patterns, we mean that the features of this pattern are computed from the values of f or from some linear combinations of them, such as power in some frequency band. In the case of geometric patterns, the function f can be thought of as producing geometrical patterns in its domain, such as the set, the set of its points of discontinuity. The distinction affects which extra random variables we need to describe the pattern. For value patterns, we typically add coefficients in some expansion to describe the particular signal. For geometric patterns, we add certain points or subsets of the domain of features of, su of such subsets. Traditional statistical pattern recognition and the traditional theory of stationary processes 
deal only with the values of f, not the geometry of its domain. Let us be more specific and describe these patterns more explicitly by distinguishing two sorts of geometric patterns, those involving deforming the geometry and those involving hierarchical geometrical pattern. First, value patterns and linear superposition. The most standard value model creates the observed signal from the linear superposition of, of fixed or learned basis functions. We assume the observed signal has values in the real vector space S from X to V and that it, and that it is expanded in terms of auxiliary functions S sub alpha from X to V uh, such that S equals the sum over alpha of C sub alpha S sub alpha. In vision, X is a set of, of pixels and for a grade level images, V is a set of real real numbers. Here the coefficients C sub alpha are hidden random variables and either the functions S sub alpha may be a, a universal basis such as sines and cosines or wavelets or some learned templates as in Carhood and Loeb expansions or the S sub alphas may be random. The simplest case is to allow one of them to be random and to think of it as a residual such as an additive noise term. An important case is that of expanding a function into its components on in various scales as in waveless expansions. So the terms S sub alpha are simply the components of S on scale alpha. See figure 2 for an example of a face expanded into three images representing a structure on fine, medium and coarse scales. Other variants are 1. Amplitude modulation in which the low and high frequencies are combined by multiplication instead of addition and 2. The case in which S is just a discrete sample from the full function sum of C alpha S alpha. Quite often the goal of such an expansion from a statistical point of view is to take the coefficients C sub alpha as, an ind as independent as possible. If the coefficients are Gaussian and independent, this is called a principal components analysis PCA or Cahoolan Noev expansion. If, there, if they are non Gaussian but independent, it is an ICA or independent component analysis. We shall see how such expansions work very well to express the effects of lighting variation on phase signals. So figure 2, a multi-scale decomposition of an image of a face of a well-known computer scientist. In the top row images, the face is progressively blurred. The three bottom images are the successive differences. Adding them together, plus the blurriest version, gives back the original face. Note how the different scales contain different information. At the finest, the exact location of the edges is depicted. In the middle, the local features are seen, but the gray level of the skin and hair are equal. And at the coarsest, the global shapes are shown. Two, simple patterns and domain wrapping. Two signals generated by the same object or event in different contexts typically differ due to expansions or contractions of their domains, possibly at varying rates. Phonemes may be pronounced faster or slower, and the image of a face may be distorted by varying its expression and viewing angle. Remark 2. Also, some previous, previously unseen parts of the face may rotate into view, and this must be modeled in another way, such as by three-dimensional models. By the way, this is an important research line. In speech, this is called time warping, and in vision, this is modeled by flexible templates. Assuming that the observed signal is a random map S from X to V, as above, then our model includes warping, which is an observed random variable psi, uh, psi from X to X, and a normalized signal S sub zero such that, or S naught, such that S 
approximately equals S naught composed with psi. In other words, the warp inputs S in a more standard form S0. Here S0 might be a fix uh, that is non-random template or it might itself be random although one aspect of its variability has been eliminated by the warping. Note that when X is a vector space we can describe the warping Psi as a vector of displacement Psi of X minus X of specified points. But the components of this vector are numbers representing coordinates of points, not values of the signal. That is, the domain of S, not the range of S, as in the previous class of deformations. This is a frequent confusion in the literature. An example from the PhD thesis of Peter Hellman is shown in Figure 3. Figure 3, A and D, two images of the same woman's face. When warping shows shown by the arrows in the image C is applied to the face in D, image B is produced, which nearly matches image A. Note, however, that no teeth are pre present in D, so the warping stretches the lips to cover the mouth. Three, hierarchical geometric patterns in parsing the signal. A fundamental fact about real-world signals is that their statistics vary radically from point to point. That is, they do not come from a so-called stationary process. This non-stationarity is a basic statistical trace of the fact that the world has a discrete as well as continu continuous behavior. It is made up of discrete events and objects. A central problem in the analysis of such signals is to tease apart these parts of its domain so as to explicitly label the distinct objects and events affecting the signal. In speech, these distinct parts are the separate phones, phonemes, words, phrases, sentences, and finally, whole speech acts. In vision, there are the various objects, their parts, and the groupings present in the viewed scene. Note that in both cases, the objects or processes are usually embedded in each other and hence form a hierarchy. The geometric formalism for this is a grammar. Put in, the, in this ge gener general setting, if S is a map from X to V, the basic and observed hidden va random variable is the three subsets X sub A in X, typically with labels L sub alpha, such that for every node A and with children B, X sub alpha equals the union for A to B of X B. Typically, grammar also gives stochastic model for an elementary signal S sub T from X T to R for all leaves T of the tree. It requires that S at X sub T approximates S sub T. The most developed formalism for such grammars are the models called either random branching processes or probabilistic context-free grammars, PCFGs. Most situations, however, require context-sensitive grammars. That is, the probability of a tree does not factor into terms, one for each node and its children. A parse tree of parts is very natural for the face. The parts correspond to the usual facial features, the eyes, nose, mouth, ears, eyebrows, pupils, eyelids, and so forth. An example, decomposing a dog from the work of Zhu, is shown in figure 4. Figure 4, the grammatical decomposition of a dog into parts from the work of Song Chen Zhu, courtesy of Song Chen Zhu, A. The grammar generates a tree of protrusions for the limbs in a basic strip for the body. B. Each part is given concrete realization of, as a subset of the plane with constraints so they match up. C. These parts are assembled. What makes the inference of the unobserved random variables in pattern theory difficult is not that any of the above models are necessarily hard to use, but rather that all of them tend to coexist 
and then inference becomes especially challenging. In fact, the full model of a signal may involve warping and superposition at many levels, In a tree of parse trees may be needed to express the full hierarchy of parse. The world is not simple. Bayesian probability theory, pattern analysis, and pattern synthesis. Another key element of pattern theory is its use of Bayesian probability theory. An advantage of this Bayesian approach compared with other vision theories is that it requires that we first create a stochastic model and afterwards seek algorithms for inferring on the basis of this model. Thus, it separates the algorithms from the models. This distinguishes pattern theory from such neural network approaches such as multilayer perceptrums. From our perspective, these theories try to solve two difficult tasks, both modeling and computation, at once. In a Bayesian approach, as in hidden Markov models and Bayes nets, we first learn the model and verify them explicitly by stochastic sampling, and then seek algorithms for applying the models to practical problems. We believe that, model, that learning models and algorithms separately will lead to more tractable problems. Moreover, the explicit nature of the representations leads to a better understanding of the internal works of an algorithm and to know to what problems they will generalize. We now give a brief introduction to the techniques of Bayesian probability theory. In general, we wish to infer the state of the random variable S describing the state of the world given some measurement, say, some observed random variable I. Thus, the variables S would correspond to the hidden variables in our representations of the world, such as the variables representing the shape of a face, and the measurement I would correspond to the observed images. Within the Bayesian framework, one infers S by considering the probability of S given I, the a posteriori probability of the state of the world given the measurement. Note that the definition of conditional probabilities, we have P of S given I times P of I equals P of S and I, which is equal P of I given S, times P of S. Divided by P of I, we obtain Bayes' theorem, which says that P of S given I equals P of I given S times P of S over P of I, which is the same thing over the sum over all possible states S prime of P of I given S prime times P of S prime which is proportional to the thing above. So the simple theorem re-expresses P of S given I, the probability of the state given the measurement, in terms of P of I given S, the probability of the observing the measurement given the state, and P of S, the probability of the state. Each of the terms on the right-hand side of the above equation has an intuitive interpretation. The expression P of I given S, often termed the likelihood function, is a measure of the likelihood of a measurement, given that we know the state of the world. In this book, I is usually an image, and this function is also called the imaging model. To see this, note that given we know the state of the world, such as light sources, the objects, and the reflectance properties of the surfaces of the objects, we can recreate as an image or particular view of the world. Yet, due to the noise in our imaging system and imprecision of our models, this recreation will have an implicit degree of variability. Thus, P of I given S probabilistically models this variability. The expression P of S referred to as prior model models our prior knowledge ab about the world. In vision, one often says that the prior is necessary because the reconstruction of the three-dimensional world from a two-dimensional view is not well posed. A striking illustration is given by, quote, moody faces, images of faces in strong light that illuminate part of the face to saturation and leave the rest black, figure five. A, quote, moody, quote, face 
of a world of psychophysicists left, and the same image with contrast and left right reverse, making it nearly unidentifiable right. These images tend at first to be confusing and then to suddenly look like quite like a quite realistic face. But if these images are presented with the opposite contrast, they are nearly unrecognizable. We interpret this to mean that we have a lot of information on the appearance of faces in our learned prior model, and this information can be used to fill in the missing parts of the face. But if the contrast is reversed, we cannot relate our priors to this image at all. As with Moody face example, in general, the image alone is not sufficient to determine the scene, and consequently, the choice of priors becomes critically important. They embody the knowledge of the patterns of the world that the visual system uses to make valid three-dimensional inferences. Such assumptions have been proposed by workers in biological vision and include Gibson's ecological constraints and Mars' natural constraints. More than general principles, however, we need probability models on the representations that are sufficiently rich to model all the important patterns of the world. It has become increasingly clear that fully non-parametric models need to be learned to effectively model virtually all non-trivial classes of patterns. See, for example, texture modeling in Chapter 4. What can we do in Bayesian model of the pattern signals of the world? On the one hand, we can use it to perform probabilistic inference, such as finding the most probable estimate of, a, of the state of the world contingent on having observed a particular signal. This is called the maximum a posteriori map estimate of the state of the world. On the other hand, we can sample from the model, for example, fixing some of the world variables S and using this distribution to construct simple sample signals I generated by various classes of objects or events. A good test of whether the prior has captured all the patterns in some class of signals is to see whether these samples are good imitations of life. From a pattern theory perspective, the analysis of the patterns in a signal and the synthesis of these signals are inseparable problems. And use a common probabilistic model, computer vision should not be separated from computer graphics, nor should speech recognition be separated from speech generation. By the way, a side remark, on a practical algorithm, sometimes you cannot use synthesis all the time. People especially if you have real-time constraints. So maybe people already knew that, they just don't do it because of efficiency reasons. Well, anyways, it's helpful to also consider the patterns in signals from the perspective of information theory. See the book by Cover and Thomas. This approach has its roots in the work of Barlow. See also Rissonen. The idea is that instead of writing out any particular perceptual signal I, in raw form as a table of values, we seek a method of encoding I that minimizes its expected length in bits. Well, this part is important. That is, we take the advantage of the patterns poss possessed by most I to encode them in a compressed form. We consider coding schemes that involve choosing various auxiliary variables S and then encoding the particular I by using these S, for instance, S might be might determine a specific signal I sub S and, then, and we then need only to encode the deviation I minus I S. We write this length of the code of I and S equal the length of the code of S plus length of coding I using S. The mathematical problem in the information theoretic setup is as follows. For a given I, find that S leading to the shortest encoding of I. This optimal choice of S is called the minimum description length, MDL, estimate of the code S for a given I. So the MDL estimate of S is the argument over S of the length of the code of S plus the length of the code of I using S. Moreover, one can then seek the encoding scheme leading to the shortest expected coding of all I's given some distribution of the signals I. There is a close link between the Bayesian and the information theoretic approaches given by Shannon's optimal coding theorem. 
This theorem states that given a class of signals i, the coding scheme for such signals for which a random signal has the smallest expected length satisfies the length of code of i equals minus the log in base 2 of p of i, where the fractal bit lengths are achieved by actually coding several i's at once. Doing this, the left hand side gets asymptotically close to the right hand side when longer and longer sequences of signals are encoded at once. We may apply Shannon's theory theorem both to encoding S and to encoding I given S. For these encodings, the length of code of S equals minus log in base 2 of P of S and length of the code of I using S equals minus log in base 2 of P of I given S. Therefore, taking log in base 2 of equation 1, we get, e we get equation 2 and find that, most that the most probable estimate of S is the same as the MDL estimate. So equation 1 is this one. Taking the log, we get, we get that using this. Finally, pattern theory also suggests a general framework for algorithms. Many of the early algorithms in pattern recognition were purely bottom-up. For example, one class of algorithms started with a signal, computed a vector of features or numerical quantities throughout the thought to be essential f attributes of the signal, and then compared these feature vectors with those expected for signals in various categories. This method was used to classify images of alphanumeric characters or phonemes, for instance. Such algorithms offer no way of reversing the process of generating typical signals. The problem these algorithms encountered was that they had no way of dealing with anything unexpected, such as a smudge on a paper partially obscuring a character, or a cough in the middle of speech. These algorithms did not say what signals were expected, only what distinguished typical signals in each category. In contrast, a second set of algorithms works by actively reconstructing the signal being analyzed. In addition to the bottom-up stage, there is a top-down stage in which a signal with the detected properties is synthesized and, I would say, robustly compared to the present input signal. See figure 6. What needs to be checked is whether the input signal agrees with the synthesized signal to within normal tolerances, or whether the residual is so great that the input has not been correctly or fully analyzed. This architecture is especially important for dealing with signals with parse structure, in which one component of the signal partially obscures the other. So figure 6, the fundamental architecture of pattern theory. Inputs is a signal F, comparison of input F with reconstruction F of sub W. Uh, bottom up path, the features of difference of F and FW, completing or modifying a world model, and a top down path, synthetic reconstruction of FW, and our output is an estimate W. So F would be like signal function. And W would be like some truth from the world. So when this happens, the features of the two parts of the signal get confused. Only when the obscuring signal is explicitly labeled and removed can the features of the background signal be computed. We may describe this top-down stage as pattern reconstruction, distinct from the bottom-up purely pattern recognition stage. This framework uses signal synthesis in an essential way, and this requirement for feedback gives an intriguing relation to the known properties of the mammalian cortical architecture. Note that, although stemming from similar ideas, the idea of analysis by synthesis is logically separate from Bayesian formulation and other aspects of pattern theory. Thus, the Bayesian approach might be carried out with other algorithms, and by analysis, an analysis by these synthesis might be used to implement other, other theories. 
A var variant of this architecture has been introduced in tracking algorithms by Isard and Blake, and it is applicable whenever sources of information become available or introduced in these stages. Instead of seeking the most probable values of the world variable S in one step, suppose we sample from the posterior distribution F, uh, P of S given I. The aim is to sample sufficiently well so that no matter what later signal I prime or later information on the world S prime arrives, we can calculate an updated sample of P of S given I, I prime and S prime from the earlier sample. A final word of caution. At this point in time, no algorithms have been devised or implemented that can duplicate in computers the human ability to perceive the patterns in the signals of the five senses. Pattern theory is a beautiful theoretical analysis of the problems, but very much a work in progress when it comes to the challenge of creating a robot with human-like perceptual skills.